All right, so today's video, we're going to talk about anthropomorphism in the Bible. Let's get into it right here on Keeping It In Context. All right, so what is anthropomorphism? Anthropomorphism, by definition, is the attribution of human characteristics or behaviors to an animal, an object, or a deity. Believe it or not, many TV shows, movies, uh, advertising commercials, branding companies uh, use anthropomorphism all the time. They use non-human characters that look and act like human beings. Disney animal characters like Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy are all examples of anthropomorphic characters. Uh, the movie Cars with characters such as Lightning McQueen and, and Mater, Simba, Mufasa, Scar, and all the other uh, talking animals from The Lion King are all examples of anthropomorphic characters. Tony the Tiger, who lets everybody know that the Frosted Flakes are great, is a perfect example. Geico uh, with the Talking Lizard is an anthropomorphic character that the company uses. Even Chester the Cheetah, who is a smooth-talking, fashionable, anthropomorphic mascot for the Cheetos brand. Anthropomorphism is used pretty much in, in everything, really. It's used in writings, it's used in mythology, and it's even used in in religion. The word anthropomorphism comes from two Greek words, anthropos, which means man or human, and morphe, which means form. In theological terms, and more specifically in Judaism and Christianity, anthropomorphism is the process of assigning human features and, and characteristics to God, such as arms, hands, feet, eyes, and so forth. For example, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15 says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Psalm chapter 31 and verse 16 says, Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, save me from thy mercy's sake. In Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 6 it says, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant. In Isaiah 66 and verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 5. Also righteousness will be thy belt around his hips and faithfulness the belt around his waist. Just kind of funny to me that God would have hips and a waist. Job chapter 4 and verse 9 says, By the blast of God they perish and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 27. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar burning with his anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury and his tongue is like a devouring fire. God has no true set form. He is not someone or something that we can tangibly measure out or, or give structure to. Uh, he cannot be conformed to any image that, that we may try to give to him. And so God allowing the writers to use anthropomorphic language is basically uh, God's way of condescending to accommodate for our finite ability to truly understand who he is and how he interacts with us. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, you see here that when the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed, notice, by the finger of God. Now, one needs to understand that a giant finger did not literally emerge from heaven and etch the words onto those stone tablets. But in order for the hearers and the readers to comprehend the supernatural power which was able to create those tablets, in addition to the seriousness of why the commandments on those tablets must be kept uh, by Israel, the, the writer had to limit his description of God's activity to fit a shape that humans would be able to recognize. You see, understanding the purpose for why anthropomorphism is used in scripture is very important because a lack of understanding its purpose can at times misrepresent the reality and even the makeup of God. Uh, many strange uh, doctrines and even heretical teachings have, have manifested due to a, a, a lack of understanding what anthropomorphism is and why it's used. For example, Mormons and many word of faith leaders such as uh, Kenneth Copeland believe that God does have an actual physical 
uh, human-like body because of the many human features that they see in the Bible. Kenneth Copeland has been quoted saying, according to Isaiah 40 and verse 12, God measured out the heavens with a nine inch span. Well, my span is eight and three quarter inches long. So God's span is a quarter of an inch longer than mine. So you see God stands somewhere around six two, six three weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple hundred pounds a little better. By doing what is called eisegesis to uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12, Mr. Copeland here has come up with a version of God that is uh, absolutely foreign even to God himself. In the Mormons Documents and Covenants book in chapter 130 verses 22 and uh, uh, 23 states that the Father and the Son have bodies of flesh and bones and they cite Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 as a means of confirming this um, theology. Now, although Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 is not a text that is anthropomorphic um, in, in language per se, by taking that scripture that speaks of God's image and characteristics, uh, whether through personification, anthropomorphism, or any other literary language without carefully uh, analyzing the context of the scripture will end up producing false doctrines such as this. Genesis chapter one and verse 26 is not suggesting that because God created us as human beings with a human body, that when it says that we were created in his image, therefore means that God himself is a human and has a human body is simply ridiculous, it's error. For we also know that if you look at other scriptures in John, for example, chapter four and verse 24, that God is spirit, and we know that according to Luke 24 and verse 39, that a, a spirit does not have flesh and bones. Theologian Wayne Grudem in his book, Systematic Theology, says that it should caution us not to take any one of these anthropomorphic descriptions by itself and isolate it from its immediate context or from the rest of what scripture says about God. Now, although anthropomorphic language is all throughout the Bible, there are times where God does decide to reveal himself in a human-like form, and those are called theophanies or Christophanies. The word theophany comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and phaino, meaning appear. Theophany then means the appearance of God, and Christophany would mean appearance of Christ. One theophany that we see in the Old Testament would be in Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 3, where God appears to Abraham and it says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebith trees of Mamre. As he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day, so he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now favor, found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Now one Christophany would be one in Daniel chapter three and verse 24 through 25. The Bible says, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we uh, tied up and threw in the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now what Nebuchadnezzar sees here appears to be uh, a, a, a man, or at least a shape of a man, and he calls him uh, a son of, of the gods. Um, other translations say son of God, but needless to say, uh, the point here is that this is a Christophany. It is an appearance of Christ, and we see this in the Old Testament. These examples and many others that we can pull are not anthropomorphic, they're not figures of speeches, but they are literal uh, instances and special instances where uh, God chooses to uh, reveal himself, to manifest himself in a human form, and he even does it in other forms such as fire and clouds and as a warrior for a specific uh, moment um, and for a specific purpose. But apart from anthropomorphism and apart from theophanies and Christophanies, there was a time in which God did take on a literal human body, and that time, my friends, was at the incarnation. John chapter one and verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh, not anthropomorphic, but literal, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, 
full of grace and truth. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2 in the Amplified Version, it says, By this you know and recognize the Spirit of God, every spirit that acknowledges and confesses the fact that Jesus Christ has actually come in the flesh as a man is from God. God is its source. So as we conclude here, uh, obviously as students of the Word of God, we, we see that understanding the language of the Bible is important as it helps us to uh, understand the theology and understand how we view God. And when it comes to anthropomorphism, um, anthropomorphism is just another literary way of uh, uh, helping us to understand um, God and how he interacts with us. And so that's it for this video. If you like the content, uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Leave some comments if you would like. And uh, hit that notification bell if you haven't already uh, so that you can be aware of whatever videos will, that will come up in the future. Well, of course, as always, as you go back out into studying the scriptures, just remind yourself that as you study the word, make sure that you tell yourself, I got to keep everything in context.